We are now weeks into this pandemic, weeks into the fear, weeks into shortages of food and toilet paper and diapers, weeks into social distancing, which is just a nice way of saying isolation, weeks into a failing economy, income loss, layoffs, job losses, housing insecurity, and no one really knows how long it will last. Each day, um, taken by itself, can feel just a little strange, maybe, inconvenient, annoying. But as the days add up, and with news every day that seems to reveal with depressing and, and increasing clarity that our leaders were caught flat-footed, they don't know what they're doing, and that some even want to take advantage of the crisis of illness and even death to profit from it. All of that taken with the ongoing lack of interaction with other people, with people we love, or even people we don't know, it's becoming much more than annoying. There haven't been yet any um, direct All Saints death related to COVID-19 yet, but I know some of us know people who have it or have had it, and some of us know at least one person who has died from it, and we know that we have a long way to go before the pandemic reaches its peak. This is all real, very real, and it's a taste of death in multiple forms. Uh, and it's just outside our doors, and in some cases, it's already coming through our doors. This pandemic has brought us face to face with the power of death. Jesus comes face to face with death in the gospel today, too. And because we are the church, Christ's body, we go there with him to that uncomfortable place, the threshold of a tomb, right to the border of the realm of death. Death, the enemy of creation, is holding Jesus' beloved friend Lazarus in the darkness of the tomb. And as Jesus gets closer and the effects of the enemy become clearer, especially in his friends who mourn, scripture says that Jesus is deeply disturbed in spirit and troubled. I'm probably a Christian today and not a Buddhist, in part because of this story. I got really close to uh, Buddhism in uh, high school and college. I still love the Buddha. I love Buddhism. If I ever, somehow, this won't happen, but if I ever got convinced that God doesn't exist, I'd probably become a Buddhist. But my sense is that if the Buddha were in Jesus' place in this story, that peaceful, enlightened smile would never leave his face. The Buddha, I think, would not be deeply disturbed in spirit and troubled at his friend's death. I think that's what enlightenment means. I don't mean that he wouldn't be compassionate. I don't mean that he wouldn't care. He's good at that. But I don't think it would have that effect on him, the effect that it has on Jesus. Jesus' reaction, his being deeply disturbed in spirit and troubled, that speaks to something pretty deep uh, in me. That in the face of death, Jesus is not peaceful that in fact he's the opposite of peaceful. He doesn't maintain a smile, he cries. And since this same gospel, John's gospel says right in its prologue that Jesus is God, that means that according to this story, in the face of death, God cries. I'm sort of afraid that we Christians have forgotten that death is the enemy. Most of the time, we protect ourselves from the reality of death. We're amazingly creative in the ways we keep death at the margins of our lives. We've created whole industries uh, to distract us from it. We fill our lives with countless entertainments and endless busyness so that we don't have to face it. 
We push death to the edges of our lives. We keep it distant. And not just literal death, but the death in all its forms, and it takes so many, the hunger of the starving poor, the victims of war and terror and crime and police violence, isolation and loneliness, disease and addictions of all sorts, you can keep going. That's all aspects of death. And when we are forced to think about it, like now, we do our best to minimize it. You know, we, we get good at reducing it to abstractions like numbers, or sort of biological necessity. You know, death is just a natural part of life. We even repeat cliches about things like, um, you know, coming to terms with death and accepting death and making peace with death. But in this story, Jesus does not avoid death or soften it. He doesn't ignore it or hide from it or make up nice stories or sing nice songs to soften it or make it less real. He also does not accept death as a natural part of life which if you think about it, uh, amounts to death's victory over creation since everyone and everything will eventually die. When Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, approach Jesus to tell him about their brother's death, he does not say, oh, God wanted another angel in heaven, or death is a natural part of life, or he's in a better place, or the lie of lies, everything happens for a reason. He didn't say anything like that. He cries. On March 15th, 2012, my younger brother died. His name was Chris. And I remember when I got the news having a hard time believing that he was dead. I don't think that's unusual. I flew to St. Louis right away and I went to church uh, with my sister-in-law and my nephews the following Sunday, which was a good thing to do, but it was the kind of church that had no visual representation of Jesus on the cross, no crucifixes. And though that congregation acknowledged Chris's death, it was in a way that I think, uh, for me at least, moved to soften it too quickly. You know, I wasn't ready um, to look for Uh, the positive side or, or even to be comforted at that point, I needed to face the reality of death. So by the time I got out of church, it was Sunday afternoon, and, uh, At that time, no Episcopal churches in the St. Louis area had a Sunday afternoon or evening masses, so I went to an afternoon mass at the Roman Catholic St. Louis Cathedral Basilica, and at the center of everything we were doing in that place was a crucifix, the image of a dead man hanging on a cross. There's no way to avoid the reality of death when you see that. But here's the thing. It was also true that having it so central was a statement that we are not afraid to look at this. Death is not something to be feared because Christ has overcome it. In today's gospel, Jesus approaches death and he faces it head on. And when Jesus approaches the tomb, that threshold of death, he's not interested in making peace with death. When Jesus approaches the tomb, scripture says that he is deeply disturbed in spirit and troubled. The Greek word there for greatly disturbed is embrimaomai, which means more than upset or sad. Jesus was sad, Lazarus was his friend. But this word means something more like he shudders with deep emotion, even that he snorts like a horse. And in a lot of uh, non-biblical usages, um, that ancient Greek word is used for the noise that a war horse makes as it rears up to charge into battle. It's a physical reaction. And in ancient Greek, this word almost always means anger. So sure, Jesus is sad and feels compassion, but more importantly, he's angry. Not at Martha or Mary or the other mourners, obviously not at Lazarus. Jesus is angry at his enemy, death. Jesus approaches the tomb where death holds his friend, and he isn't interested in making peace with it. Jesus knows death is not natural. He knows that it's a perversion of creation. He approaches death as the enemy that it is. 
Jesus approaches death and he sees the enemy of his beloved creation and he says no. And more, Jesus calls Lazarus out from the hands of his enemy. Unbind him, he says. Let him go. There's a reason that the church hears the story on the last Sunday in Lent, the Sunday before we begin Holy Week. In the raising of Lazarus, Jesus is saying to death, I'm coming for you. Because in Holy Week, Jesus will fight death again. Jesus will fight death at the Last Supper. Jesus will fight death on the cross. Jesus will fight death in the tomb not stopping at the entrance like he did at Lazarus' tomb, but crossing the threshold and entering into its darkness, facing and fighting death head on and conquering it, liberating all of creation, freeing us all from death in all its forms, forcing death to unbind us and to let us go.